Hey guys, welcome back. Um, so thanks for tuning in. We got a pretty good crowd tonight, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I see someone wants the whole theme song. Sorry, I we just don't have time. We got too much stuff to cover. Uh, so today we have a special guest. So one of the things that I know the least about is mushrooms. So I've got a buddy of mine, Avery from High Country Fungi, fungi uh, who's going to come on to uh, chat with you fine folks and uh, answer some questions and teach you some stuff because I can't. So Avery, say hi. Oh, I see uh, my comrade Max is in attendance. Good to see you, Max, and good to see, well, good to talk to everyone. Um, being here, a big fan of the podcast, so it was an honor when Andy asked me to join. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to learning something because I've grown mushrooms once, uh, and it was the toilet papered method where you like soak the, the toilet paper roll and inoculate, and it was all right. I, I probably should have gotten a lot more mushrooms out of it than I did because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but but it was fun, and I I like mushrooms, so I want to learn more. So that that's where you oh, come in. No pressure. <laughs> well, that's awesome that that was like your only venture in mushrooms because that's like that lowest tech, but that is what like I would encourage with it's like just for a fun project um, because. It's just to show that you can it expand from there. Um, just, uh, I'm going to get into basically a brief overview of my history. Uh, we're located in West uh, and I started farm about a half ago. Uh, I really got interested in mushrooms about five to six years ago. Uh, their healing properties are what really... Um, kind of spoke to me uh see how I look like a guy well thanks um and so uh I, I had gotten into the mushrooms years ago was on a totally different career path and um just decided to start my and a half ago once I got the space um that was really the limiting factor an old brewery in North Carolina that actually used to be uh an old mica company. So this area used to produce, uh, I think it was like 70% of the mica that was uh, exported uh, to Europe during World War II. So a lot of history in that building. We, um, we grow commercially. So right now we provide our local farmers markets. Uh, we also provide uh, multiple restaurants and we're growing anywhere at the height of season about two to three hundred pounds of mushrooms per week um so let's see so sound is cutting in and i apologize i have a decent internet connection I don't know if this. um let me you know if it keeps cutting out though and so basically we uh intensively cultivate mushrooms um and i want to make available to you all uh, some basic methods where you can cultivate at home, you can cultivate for your family, your friends, or for a larger community, and you'll have the skill set um, to at least be able to do that with some confidence. Um, mushroom cultivation can be quite complicated, um, but it's really as, about as complicated as you want to make it. Um, see audio audio is good sorry audio is good yeah um so that being said uh you can cultivate mushrooms as intensively or as passively as you want um so basically what i'd like to tell on first uh i guess in the comments if y'all would let me know kind of where your understanding uh of when cultivation is. Do you only have experience? If so, what experience? Um, and I will kind of work around that. Uh, I'd like to start with something fairly simple. Uh, it's log cultivation. So, actually, Andy, I'm going to have you help me with this. Um, sure. 
be a good place to start is, um, I mean, I can cover what mushrooms are uh, and how they work, um, or I can, you know, you know start yeah, I mean, basically any um, Yeah, I guess I think the, the parts that are important to understand um, why things work, so like the, the functional components of how mushrooms grow uh, in relation to like why this is the material you might grow it in, or this is where, uh, you, why you need to keep it moist at this point and less moist at that point or whatever it might be. Okay, great. So what we'll be talking about is, uh, for this purpose, uh, are cultivable mushrooms, uh, that are gourmet smells. So things like oyster shiitake mushrooms, um, and all the way to reishi and turkey tail and things like that. Uh, these mushrooms are considered primary decomposers. They're saprophytes. Um, so they get all their nutrients from uh, absorbing all, all, all their nutrients from uh, non-organic non matter. Organic. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Uh, uh, but... Um, so how we start in the lab, I'll explain my process at home. So we take to a very extreme and we start in a laboratory, a sterile laboratory. And think of instead of seeds, mushroom spores. Uh, so basically we start from spore. That spore goes to nutrient media. So at all these different growth, you're feeding the mushrooms. Um, at this first stage, we're feeding them in a petri dish on, on a meat agar, and that is derived from seaweed. And then there's additives like um, you know, malt extract that brewers use. You can use flakes. You can use dog food. So um, as far as a wide range of using what you have on hand, if I ran out of uh, my typical media in a pinch, I could use dog food. So anyways, it's just a simple nutrient source to, to get the a culture of my seed, which evolves out of the spore, um, which germinates from the spore. Uh, you know, some simple nutrients so that it can continue to procreate. Um, so we'll start it there. We'll observe the culture to make sure that it is healthy that is growing, that it's contaminant free is really the point of the sterile lab. Um, you're ensuring that the mycelium stays healthy, that it has no competitor organisms um, that's vying for its food. So our sterile procedure, I mean, I shower beforehand, I'm gloved, masked, um, the whole the whole get up. We're in front of a sterile flow. It's a HEPA, grade, a HEPA filter that's hospital grade. Um, which has been really, as an aside, it's been really interesting to see, just like to have that understanding and then to translate that into understanding COVID. Like I wear a mask for my cultures uh, to keep them from getting contaminated. So it's, uh, there were a lot of parallels there that made COVID easier to understand. Um, so Avery, um, mm -hmm. so in terms of this, the I think for me personally, uh, I think about like sterilization and I feel like I'm used to, dealing with dirty things and that's like a huge um i don't want to say mm -hmm. fear but like how do i know i'm not going to screw up if like i know somebody that does this professionally needs to like take a lot more steps that i'm not going to do for like i said a, a toilet paper roll of mushrooms uh like how, how does that like translate to somebody that wants to do it at home so basically um if you'd like to you know grow mushrooms consistently you're going to have to find a spawn provider um so that would be someone like me and i would encourage everything to look in your local areas and see if you can find a local mushroom cultivator uh, facebook's a popular place to find mushroom cultivators but uh, basically once you have spawn uh, of the particular mushroom that you're trying to grow and spawn is just usually a grain that has been colonized by the mycelium in a sterile laboratory so from that point forward, there are a lot of nonce that you can use um, or techniques that you can use. Um, one of the most popular ones is uh, it's called cold water pasteurization. It's very simple. What you do is you fill 
a vessel like a livestock trough. I have a big livestock trough, trap and tractor supply. I fill it with chopped straw. And well, first I fill it with water, and then I uh, um, use pickling lime, or you can, I think you can use um, ag lime. You'd have to check though, it's a calcium. Uh, yeah, you just have to check. But um, you basically are raising the pH of that water uh, so that it's basically killing any of the competitor microorganisms in the straw. So I will take that hydro, I'll test it with my pH strips, and then I will soak my straw, and I will let that soak for about 24 hours, and then I will pull it out, and you can do all this outdoors. I mean, you obviously want to like clean your hands, and the best time to do something like this is in the evening. But then I would, because it, Competitor spore load lower in the evening times. But I would have a big table, and I'd spread out my straw, and then I would take the spawn that I got from my spawn provider. I'd break it up, I'd mix it with this straw, and I would pack it in. Uh, this is where you can use any type of vessel uh, as your fruiting container. Uh, so a lot of people will use like an old laundry basket because it's got the slits in it, and you can do layers of the spawn and the uh, straw, or you can pre-mix it. Um, and layer it in there, and then you would find a place uh, to let it colonize. But you can use, I mean, laundry baskets. Um, people at commercial scale will kind of will use uh, poly tubing, which, depending on your feelings about using plastic, um, you know that it, it, as long as you have another, you know, a bucket, you can use a five-gallon bucket that you drill holes into. Um, so a little bit of spawn, uh, like a three to five pound bag of spawn can create quite a bit of mushrooms. Um, so you would expand it to however many you know, fruiting containers you wanted to use. Then you would find a place where it could sit around 60 to 70 degrees. Um, and those parameters are kind of flexible. Um, especially if you're using uh, readies are very forgiving. Um, then you let it colonize, and that process takes about uh, anywhere from seven to ten days, you know, up to two weeks. Uh, and you're observing the mycelium will be eating through the straw, colonizing, the and then you will put it into what is called fruiting conditions. So basically, when you're keeping it dark, think of mushroom ground or mycelium body underground. Uh, you're going to introduce it into the conditions it needs. The mushrooms are not, uh, they do not photosynthesize like plants, they are phototrophic. So, uh, and they really only use light as uh, a trigger for growth. Um, all they do sync up well with the uh, 12 by 12 um, light cycle. Uh, so, a common myth is that you know, like mushrooms grow in complete darkness. Um, we use LED lights full spectrum for our commercial grow. Um, but I'd take your fruity container, put it outside. Um, and then you want to give it some uh, humidity. And you want to find a spot that's about 80% shade. And um, you can manually mist it. I just have a mister nozzle on the end of my hose. I just mist it down multiple times a day. Um, and something I want to note is like, so for mushrooms, they uh, contain 90% water. So when you're, um, so when you're, um, what? So 90% water, the mushrooms are 90% water, and so you want to think that you can provide them um, quite a bit of water, and you can kind of base on how you water mushrooms, um, you kind of base that on what weather patterns are. Yes, so cultivators using large plastic bags and vessels, cutting holes in the sides, uh, that, yeah, that definitely is an option. But it's not really reusable. Um, 
And if you're doing this so for I a small ask, scale, huh? yeah. Uh, quick question. Um, sure. So, one of the things that uh, you had mentioned is this like giant basin with water and straw. And is straw something that's interchangeable based on what you have access to, or is it? Do you need something that's like a carbon-rich source or uh, a carbohydrate-heavy source? Like, what? What do you know? What the nece uh, necessary things are for that? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, typically is sawdust uh, that has been sterilized. Now, that requires to inoculate that. Just given the nature of the sawdust, it's really susceptible to contamination. Um, so we have to spawn or pour your spawn into your substrate, which is what your meat grow medium is called, um, in front of the sterile flow. Straw is just really forgiving, and uh, it colonizes a lot quicker. So kind of the idea is you're, you're adding your spawn to your substrate in a large enough quantity so that it's fairly saturated, so that it takes a very short amount of time be colonized by the mycelium thus you know beating out competitors um and i'll see in my lab sometimes if i have contamination it'll be a spot of green and it'll be going at war with the mycelium and uh sometimes it will completely take it over so you're just basically increasing your chances um of success that way uh, so this is where we can kind of segue into log cultivation um so in that same trough uh, around, and you can uh, cut logs multiple times a year um, for log cultivation, but um, a lot of people are probably familiar with plug spawn or loose, uh, some uh, loose sawdust spawn. And Yeah, so could you just uh, quickly define a plug? So uh, I will go ahead and say that I don't really like plug spawn, I would steer clear from it, but if it's your only option, definitely use it. Uh, plug, it's really these wooden bowls that they get from the furniture industry, uh, soaked and been sterilized and inoculated with mycelium. So it's very simple, you're drilling your hole, hole in your log, plug, you're hammering it in, uh, and you're coating it with wax. Uh, I don't I don't like plugs because um, loose sawdust, I just find it penetrates the log better. So the other option is, like I mentioned earlier, is grain spawn. Other spawn is sawdust, just purely sawdust spawn. And that's what you want to use for logs. And the reason that is, is because bugs to get into the logs while they're colonizing. And if it's, they're attracted to grain. So you just use sawdust and that is attracted to that. So you're drilling a hole and they make a you know, specialty bit for it um, that you attach to a, you can use a drill or a uh, angle grinders, makes quicker work. You're going in kind of a triangle pattern, um, kind of evenly spaced out and uh, creating these holes. Then you plunger, it's about 10 bucks. Uh, you're taking and you're filling it up with sawdust and you're plunging it into the holes. And then you're going behind it. I usually have a pot with beeswax um, and you're sealing the holes up. And so once you've done your whole log, you've got it inoculated is the term for that. Um, once it's filled with the, the spawn, soak the log in its entire. And this is where if you don't help, you can use a body of water like a river. Um, you submerge the logs uh, for a period of 24 hours. And then you can crib stack the logs, or you can set them on a 45 degree angle. Depending on the species that you're attempting to cultivate, um, you're looking at anywhere from about a four month to an eight month colonization period. Uh, these logs, by the way, they're about uh, three to six inches in diameter. So the big log. Um, the longer that log will produce. The great thing about this cultivation method is that two years ago, we did about four, you know, more of the whole day with just the two of us. Um, and we got them all soaked. You know, we had to do soaks. But those logs, anywhere, I 
it's usually rule of thumb is uh, a year per inch of diameter. So, you know, a three inch log, three inch log could be three. I've heard of six inch logs lasting close to a decade. Um, so when I say into, uh, cultivating these passively and intensively, the log method is very passive. You're going to inoculate it, you soak it, let it colonize, and then once it colonizes after that you know, period, um, you, it'll, start, it'll start producing mushrooms. You can induce the logs to produce mushrooms by soaking them again to drop them um, on concrete. And that is supposed to simulate uh, a tree falling in the forest. So it's called, uh, there's actually for it in mycology called the knock. knock. Uh, you're basically knocking the log. It's kind of just causing the mycelium to wake up. And they're looking to reproduce by the mushroom. Um, they produce out of all the holes. You had your harvest. Um, and then you go dormant. Um, so depending on where you live, if it's, Within the if it stays within the temperature ranges that the mushroom can produce at, um, it's kind of your you know seasonal window. Uh, shiitakes and it depends on the strain of mycelium, so it really gets down to different types of say shiitakes will produce. There's all seasons. You have all season variety. You have a cold weather variety. You have a weather variety. That's usually the case for a lot of these different cultivatable mushrooms, like uh, oyster mushrooms. You can also cultivate lion's mane um, by the log method as well. It's a little bit trickier, but um, lion's mane has some incredible medicinal benefits, um, and it's just it's really incredible for you. Uh, so those two methods, the straw method, will produce mushrooms out of that basket or vessel. Uh, within just a few weeks, um, and you will be able to get a few what are called flushes from that vessel before it kind of peters out. And the other nice thing about the straw method is then you can take that well colonized straw, it's rich in mycelium, and you can um, plant that in a garden bed. So I would content, I would lay out you know a raised bed or area with more straw. Um, that you can you can sterilize that straw or pasteurize that straw with your cold water technique if you want. You don't have to. Um, but then you could use that to inoculate even more straw and then have a have a bed um, of mushrooms. And you can use I mean you can interplant these around your garden. Um, what I'll do is we we have these big production blocks that are basically just giant sawdust blocks. And what I'll do after they're done producing in the grow room is mix them up and put them in around the garden beds or in the garden beds, um, and they will just they will just take off and they enrich the soil as they continue to decompose. They'll add some fungal activity, which will work with the plant roots and you know potentially allow for mycorrhizal. Uh, chips to form it's just i mean mushrooms are resilient they look to propagate uh themselves and once you have something kind of established um with them then i mean they'll just take off so uh, those two methods are like the most kind of popular and user-friendly uh for a lot of folks um but we can i kind of want to touch on like really low tech methods because there's a lot of work being done um, within the mycology community, especially from the people I follow on Instagram, um, helping third world countries and people in third world countries uh, to set up a small grow, uh, mushroom grow operation. And they're able to feed their families and their villages. And it's pretty incredible to watch just the just the creativity that people tap into. Um, mushrooms call you to be creative. They, uh, they, this kind of this line of work call, calls you to think outside of the box um, and to use what you have. And that's, I mean, if we want to talk about kind of philosophical themes of fungi, um, there's, you know, they abound. So uh, I, I do want to address one a couple of these here because I saw. Um, 
Let's see. To the person, I tried inoculating maple logs with turkey tail plugs. Nothing grew. I didn't use enough wax, and I think it was a drought year. Yeah, so you definitely want to keep those logs. Uh, something I forgot to mention. You want to keep those logs well soaked. Um, if we go two weeks, you know, up to two weeks without rain, I will soak those logs for 20, 24 to 48 hours, uh, no matter what, even if I don't expect them pr to produce, um, just because they they need the water to keep moving uh, and to keep healthy. Or they'll just dry out and just peter out. Um, so let's see. Yeah, the log method okay. is really interesting. I think something a lot of folks, um, especially if you've got a little bit of space, anyone can find some uh, some logs that could be potentially used, uh, assuming they haven't been inoculated by something from from nature. Um, so right, right. So that's yeah, that's a great point. So um, yeah, this is where it can get a little bit technical uh, as far as like ideal conditions for logs so basically the general rule of thumb is hardwoods um anything like hemlock uh because it is anti-fungal um but yeah oak is like oak reigns supreme the large red oak tree that was had to be limbed and we that's what we made those logs out of but so yeah I'm once not... the oh go ahead i was gonna say i've heard uh mulberry is actually pretty good as well uh but i i don't have a lot of oh, experience okay. obviously yeah, and this is where, like, if I mean, this is where a lot of my cereal knowledge can grow um, because people maybe, you know, someone hasn't tried a mulberry before or like a tree that no one's really experimented with. Um, so, yeah, finding these different uh, resources to be able to grow mushrooms. I mean, we're finding out all the time that we can add these different supplements um, and additives to our substrate to make them stronger and quicker. Um, so yeah, it's there's a lot of experiment, you know, self experimentation with this sort of thing, um, and you really can't go wrong. A lot of times the materials are relatively cheap, um, but uh, yeah, so like oak definitely reigns supreme. Any hardwood alder is really great, um, and you want to cut those limbs. Um, or so, say you have. Basically, once you fell your decided, you have a window of about, um, let's so think of when you're killing the tree, when the tree is dying, you're dead. All these other competitor organisms are going to come to try and break it down. You have you know, different molds, uh, trichoderma, all these um, other competitor fungus. So the quicker you break those down, into sections and get better. Um, the rule of thumb is about a month, and you usually want to cut in the late winter or early spring before the sap gets up in trees, um, because that just makes the, the, it makes it harder for the mycelium to move. Um, so that's kind of your window. Um, yeah, then you'll uh, you want to cut your section. I mean, Think about manageable. Think about when these logs are wet and when they're heavy, where you're going with them and what you're doing with them. And this is kind of, you know, a permaculture approach of like really be thinking about how you're interacting. They're right behind house, um, easy access. So I, I've made, you know, four to five things of some pretty you know, big logs. But, you know, if you need, if you're hauling them down to a river to do your soaking, and maybe you want to do three to four inch logs that are like, you know, because once yeah. you get, I mean, it's a whole workout when you go to soak your batch of logs. But, you know, some people will have them set up in a forest where they have misters set up. Um, you know, these, you know, they'll have these little, yeah, just these little rows in the tree, in the tree lines where they've got them propped up kind of in a teepee style. And they've got misters. So you can, you can get as creative as you want. Now, uh, this might be a little um, kind of a deep dive a little bit, but like when you're talking about like if you have logs and they're inoculated and they sit out for like two weeks that you have to soak them, is there any other indicator like other than knowing the weather pattern, uh, like by what the log is doing or showing that would be like, a, hey, these need to get soaked? Oh, 
Hold on. Looks like he dropped his connection. So uh, he will hopefully be back in a second. Um, but so far, uh, I've personally learned a lot. Uh, I'll try to answer some questions as I can. Uh, so what was the other method? The straw method, um, other than the log method, where he was putting the straw in the, the bins and letting it soak and all that good stuff. Um, he's messaging me right now. Hold on. Yeah, he'll be right back. Uh, so yeah, he was putting the straw in a uh, cold water soak and then using that and stuffing into like laundry baskets or five gallon buckets or something like that. And then, um, drilling in so that you could, uh, use those. You see that a lot on YouTube and Instagram and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, it'll be up on YouTube after, uh, to watch whenever you want. Um, so the straw sterilization is, um, essentially from the way I understood it, uh, is that, uh, hold on. I think he's coming in right now. Okay. It's going to take a second, I guess. Um, so the straw sterilization, and again, I'm not an expert, so I'm just reiterating, uh, from what I've gathered is to uh, essentially get a big buck uh, like barrel 50 gallon barrel something um depending on how much straw you need filling it up with cold water soaking the straw for an extended period of time and then um utilizing that straw from there uh, i'm not 100 percent sure what's exactly causing the the um making it sterilized um, i guess it's probably killing any microbes that were in the straw that can't handle that anaerobic conditions um and then in inoculating that straw from that point oh yeah and then the pickling lime uh which would drop the ph um hold on one second uh so that would drop the ph using that pickling lime uh which if you've made like lab in korean natural farming or if you've ever like made vinegar or anything like that um dropping the low ph is uh essentially keeps any most stuff from being able to grow uh, and inhibits any uh, pathogens and things like that, which will then allow when you at introduce um, something like a, fun a fungus, uh, it can take over. So uh, as for high country fun fungi, um, he's followed us for a while. We've touched base a few times. And when we started doing these um, Twitch streams, uh, I wanted to do one on DIY mushroom production because I don't know anything. And I think, like he had said, um, the the material the um the process is pretty cheap and if you can it's a good way to produce calories um and uh you know why not grow mushrooms grow food it's something people can do in a lot of places that otherwise you might not be able to grow food um so if it's and it's like he was saying it's a pretty quick process depending on how you do it you can uh, produce mushrooms in a few weeks which is, um, other than like microgreens, there's not a whole lot of things that you can do uh, at any scale or any speed that's actually going to produce meaningful calories. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure mushrooms are pretty, uh, pretty protein heavy per, per uh, calorie, uh, which is awesome because like I said, or like I had given those examples of like microgreens and microgreens tend to be uh, lower calorie, uh, high nutrition, but you don't get a lot of protein or anything like that. So this is a nice way to balance that out. But for folks that are tuning in, if you're um, here, not because of the Poor Pearls Almanac, um, this is hosted by the Poor Pearls Almanac, a podcast about growing food and being prepared for the end of the way we live today. So we generally talk about stuff like growing food and pickling food and all sorts of cool stuff. We just released a new episode literally about an hour ago. So if you haven't tuned in yet to that episode, I mean, I hope you haven't because it just came out an hour ago, but when you've got some time, go check it out. It's actually on Korean natural farming. So uh, we talk about a lot of stuff with vinegars and pH and all that cool shit. So um, anyways, we had a short break and now we'll tune back in. Uh, someone wanted just a little clarification on the sterilization process with the uh, the cold pasteurization or the cold putting the straw in the buckets. 
Ah, yes. Dine, uh, let's see. What was the question? Uh, so you had talked about the two methods, the log and the straw. So what exactly, uh -huh. um, how is the straw um, sterilized? It was through the, the low pH, right, from the, the uh, brine? Yes, yes. So um, basically, you can also uh, use, I've used it in a pinch and it's worked. You can use uh, hardwood ash if you uh, burn your own firewood. Um, so that's you know, very, I guess, uh, alkaline. So you basically pour that in. And I don't off the top of my head know the exact range. I think it's um, anywhere around, I guess, six or seven, if that sounds right, um, pH. But once you get it into that range, um, by testing it with your strips, then you literally let this straw just sit and soak in it, make sure it's submerged and leave it for at least 12 to 24 hours. Um, and you wanna, the kind of the tricky part is, is getting, if you're buying bale straw, um, it can be in larger pieces. So you have to kind of break it down to smaller, more manageable pieces for the mushrooms to eat, usually about like one to three inches. So I'll just get a big, one of those blue, um, uh, just big blue barrels that they use at the brewery and throw the straw in there and take my weed eater and just, you know, redneck it. Um, so <laughs> you just have at it and straw goes everywhere. If you're, you know, if you're sensitive to allergies may, may not be the best thing to do, but, um, or they have, you can even use throw straw in like a wood chipper. I think, uh, they make little over the top, this little, uh, bucket top, uh, wood chippers you can feed it through. Yeah. Is the idea then, that you want more surface ma uh, mass for it to be able to exactly, travel more quickly? Exactly, exactly. So I kind of, I think of mycelium at this point, it's still in its infancy stage. Um, it still needs, I mean, so when you're, you know, if you think back, even if you're not doing the lab part, you think that is like the agar is the baby food, and then you're gradually uh, climatizing it to be able to handle more and more. So yeah, smaller pieces for it to eat, kind of like you would a baby. And then uh, as it builds strength, that this high phase, what they're called, um, will really just be quite beautiful to see it stretch out and colonize the, uh, you know, the straw. And so uh, it's at that point that you will, once it's colonizing, you kind of look for contamination. Um, so once you've got your straw on your table, once you've pulled it out of your tub, really, so you really want to uh, strain it out and get it to what's called field capacity. So field capacity is where you can squeeze something, say a massive straw or your uh, sawdust, and just a few drops of water will come out. So that's to where it's you know in that Goldilocks zone of not too wet and uh, not too dry. Uh, too wet, and it will have trouble moving through the substrate. It'll kind of get waterlogged. Uh, and to dry, you know, have enough water. So, like I've said before, I'll, you know, depending on the species you cultivate, there's a lot of forgiveness with oyster mushrooms. And I would highly encourage anybody curious to start with a fast-moving oyster mushroom, particularly a blue oyster. A blue oyster is going to be your broadest range. I've fruited blue oysters at like 44 degrees, maybe even down to 40 degrees. They just grow a little bit slower all the way up. To like the mid 70s and then if you're in somewhere like by the beach you can grow pink varieties or a tropical variety and they thrive in like 90 to 100 degree heat and they just grow so fast so that's a great option too depending on your climate awesome so i want to ask uh you had mentioned uh there's some more like low tech type ways uh could you talk a little bit about that yeah so um like with the cardboard method or the tube method that you were talking about um the let's just say for as an example the most simple method you could do if i was out walking in the woods um i wanted to try to grow some mushrooms i find an oyster cluster it's pretty big you know you're selecting your genetics in the wild you see a big cluster you want to take that cluster uh because it's doing really well but uh you'll pop that off the tree and you at the base you could take just a thin slice of that um 
of that material there, uh, that mycelium, and then you can wet your cardboard. You could even like pasteurize your cardboard if you wanted. You know, just soak a bunch of cardboard in warm water at, um, I think pasteurization temperature is like around 160. Um, keep it at that for a few hours. And, but if you don't want to go that far, you can just wet it. Um, and then you layer your mycelium between that and then just put it in a spot that's, you know, not going to get eaten and kind of warm, um, somewhat cleaner. Um, and then just let it, you can even put it in a bag whatever and then let it colonize there and that can be kind of a starter and so you could this is like this is if you're not wanting mushrooms anytime soon and you're really trying to develop to develop a low-tech cultivation method kind of almost like a shit area kind of method but um i mean then you could transfer that could become your spawn and you could transfer that to your pasteurized straw if you built up enough so um you could you take your layer of mycelium with your uh, cardboard, let that go, then maybe do a larger sheet of cardboard or, you know, any kind of like paper material and the carbon material and, uh, you know, make a bigger mat. And then once you have a nice kind of big piece of uh, mycelium, you can break that up into your straw and that would take over and produce mushrooms. I would do that more so in like if I I was trying to inoculate a garden bed just kind of a simple fun way to do that without going and buying big spawn um that um but i mean it's pretty much it for that uh, awesome so um, uh let me ask uh well you can answer that question and then i got a question about spores okay does the cardboard have enough nutrients? So I mean, it does. It does at it does at first, um, and then before it depends on the type of mushroom you're cultivating. Uh, oysters don't need um, at all. I mean, I'm using when I grow, you know, for commercial scale, I'm just using hardwood sawdust supplemented with a of either wheat bran or soy hull pellets, and uh, this is kind of a boost. But you can, I mean. You can spice it up. You can sprinkle some azomite in there, or um, you know, once you get that, again, it's the baby food concept of once you get that mycelium growing on that cardboard or uh, carbon material, then the next thing, the next stage that you progress it to, can have a little more nutrient rich. I mean, you could put it right into some, you know, you know, vermicompost or you know, normal compost or what have you, and kind of mix it in with that too. Um, it's just kind of something, you know, if you're doing it that low tech, I would do that as just like a fun science experiment. Um, kind of familiarize yourself with the design and what works with your climate and the materials you have on hand. It's like, a, like I said, it's just something if you want mushrooms quickly, you would go a different route, but it's definitely uh, a viable method once you got kind of your um steps down that makes yeah. sense so um i wanted to ask so you talked about like you can go out and you see a, whatever mushroom you happen to want um and you said just cut it and stuff it between the cardboard um mm -hmm. now i know people talk about like spore prints a lot um how does that kind of fit into all this in order and the idea of like uh continuously being able to produce mushrooms so basically the spore, uh, when the mushroom, the mushroom is the reproductive body of the mycelium. Uh, it's, you know, very appropriate that it's a kind of a, a lot of them are phallus shaped. Um, but, you know, when say an oyster fans out and get its lifespan and it says they need to procreate, it drops spores. The spores contain a whole genetic package of what's available um and that's including what you can't see inside the tree you know, so you have this mycelial body the mush all you're seeing is the mushroom this mycelial body that's running through whatever it's colonized let's say the tree you're getting the whole genetic package so you're getting the small clusters or the you know um the pairing that has the small clusters or the big clusters so when i take 
a spore print into the lab. Then I take swipes of spores. There's countless spores you swipe, and I put them on the petri dishes. And then they will grow out into that hypha. And that hypha can have different like morphological um, structures to show me that it is um, strong and healthy. So if it's uh, there's what's called rhizomorphic growth, and rhizomorphic growth is very thick and ropey growth. Um, it literally looks like white ropes. Um, if you look up, if you Google rhizomorphic growth or rhizomorphia, rhizomorphic growth, <laughs> you can see what I'm talking about. But anyways, so you, I will literally be selecting to isolate a culture from that whole genetic package. So I'm picking the most strongest looking growth and growing that out continuously, transferring that to new Petri dishes, then to fruit that out so I get the big clusters. So basically what you're doing by getting a cluster off the tree, like when I said, if I see a tree that has multiple oyster clusters all over it, um, I'm gonna pick that biggest cluster and pop it off. And could I know that cluster at that base of the, basically your culture of it, that tissue culture is going to contain the genetic pack of that particular cluster um, instead of, say, the whole mycelial body. So when I'm growing at a commercial, um, I usually work isolated genetics. These are genetics that have improved big mushrooms um, reliably quickly. Um, let's say I take a spore, say I, say I take a plate. A petri dish that has first swipe from the spore, and then I grow that out. I don't even isolate the finer genetics. Uh, I grow that out, and it grows the mushrooms of all different shapes. Um, then I would go take that big mushroom, the quickest mushroom, and I would take a tissue sample off the base of that, and grow that out. Uh, and nine that it would you would be producing a genetic of that big cluster. So if I'm, a couple of years ago, I went out and found a big lion's mane on a tree and I took a tissue sample back. And this is my first successful um, nature lab to commercial production. I found the mushroom, I cloned the base of it. I selected that growth, that strongest growth, different samples that I took, moved that onto my spawn. I grew it out indoors, and it was genetically the same. It's beautiful clusters, uh, you know, inside my grow room, and it's, it's the exact same mushroom in essence that I saw on the. So, yeah, the just the, to go back to your question, the the spores are the whole genetic package. So you're, I mean, and within that, you can be much more pop out all sorts of different traits, um, you know, size traits, smell traits, color traits. Um, there's a lot of interesting work going on with people hybridizing mushrooms of different, you know, within the same genus. So the oyster varieties of Pleurotus species or genus, and uh, um, they're hybridizing their um, genetics there to create, that have the ideal stem texture and the ideal um and the ideal shelf life so it's you know it's like selecting cultivars for plants basically there's there's a lot of overlap yeah so somebody asked um when you're lab growing what medium as in type of agar do you use great question so um you can get really general specific with your agar um what i'm finding so it's kind of uh try to relay a, a more advanced concept in cultivation. Um, so I go from agar to a grain, and that grain is my grain master. Um, that is my cleanest culture. Um, that's the, the next step of the baby food. And so you can use all different types of grain. You can use rye, you can use corn. Um, I use millet and sorghum. Um, I use what's available locally that's cheap and not having to be shipped out from the Midwest. Um, but so you can basically, I like using sorghum because my agar, I use sorghum syrup. The theory being that 
I'm getting my mushrooms started on this nutrient source, the, the sorghum syrup, and they're, they're acclimatized to that. They know it really well. So that when I do my sterile sorghum grain, it's, the uptake is rapid. It recognizes the food source. It goes right to it. There's no delay. It moves quickly through it, um, which for my goals is what I want. Um, but to answer your question, uh, you can use um, potato, what's called potato dextrose uh, agar, potato dextrose yeast agar. I mean, there's all sorts of additives like yeast extract, um, soy peptones. Um, you can use uh, brewer's malt dark malt basically all it is is a simple uh sugar source um and then the agar is just enough to hold it all together it's just a gelling agent um but they're finding that even different like qualities of agar i i now only use what's called an organic dilidium agar and that's from a particular type of red algae um that is just incredibly uh just one of the best nutrient sources you can give your mushrooms um, and like I said before, they have dog food agar recipes. So most things, uh, most cultivatable varieties will grow on any of these medias. Um, it just kind of boils down to personal preference. I find that lion's mane um, and the, uh, it's uh, the heresium is the genus. Anything of that family really likes potatoes. So um, it's just that it's kind of wispy mycelium that really just use, takes to the potato starch and produces thicker mycelium. But um, yeah, a lot of these recipes are interchangeable. Um, this you know goes for therapeutic mushrooms as well as uh, gourmet mushrooms. I hope that answered the question. Awesome, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess like for me as somebody that's new to this and I feel like I now kind of have a, a grasp um, but I think because we're talking about mushrooms, um, people have a little bit of nervousness about the idea of like, well, what if I accidentally grow the wrong thing and I don't know it? Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Like, is that a real concern or is it like going to be super obvious or um, like, is there any like things that people should just be aware of? So um, that a lot of that will boil down, you know, say the the real low tech method where you're going out. We definitely want to make sure that you are, that that oyster mushroom is an oyster mushroom. But if you're getting spawned from someone uh, that's a reliable and reputable spawn producer, and I'm happy to provide y'all with a few of those. Um, I produce my own spawn now, but I've gotten it in the past from these companies. But you're going to get, without a doubt, 100% just that one type uh, or that one variety of mushroom. It's been you know, selected for it's been grown nothing else is growing on it and so basically you're just familiarizing yourself with say oh, this is a blue oyster okay the blue oyster you know the gills look like this the gills go all the way down into the mushroom it's got this shape cap etc uh there's it's really hard to kind of mess it up um i would say more so i would caution people if they're out foraging to really familiarize yourselves with um you know what it is you're looking for uh i personally they have a course now you can take and this was implemented after uh people were getting sick at restaurants from eating uh wild forage mushrooms the forager didn't know what they were exactly but thought they did and the chef didn't know either so they've instated these courses um, it's a five years through but you go and you learn about you know how to identify these different mushrooms i would looking to for definitely get the Audubon um, the mushroom Audubon book look for local um, mushroom identification guides there's you know great ones for the southeast northeast um, yeah, a lot of different but a lot of the edible types you'll find in the wild um, there's really a few look-alike and um, you know obviously don't eat anything you're not 100% sure, free to send me a picture of something via my Instagram. It is. Um, there's a lot of indicators. You really, you really have to be not paying attention to get something that will kill you. Um, one that comes to mind is chanterelles 
and jack-o'-lantern fungus, um, which if you really look at it like, but somehow people confuse them. So um, yeah, just cultivating mushrooms, unless somehow some other species of mushroom just takes over your spawn. So, like one of the more unlikely things to happen, um, if not impossible, then definitely that, I mean, that's, that's just not going to happen. So, um, yeah, there's no worry there as long as you're, you have a good spawn producer. Um, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I feel much com more confident about growing mushrooms. So hopefully that means other people do too. And I feel like I understand it a little bit better. Uh, yeah. if anyone else has any questions, please, uh, oh. jump in. Do you, do you, do you care if I throw a few notes? on um uh foraging yeah mushrooms. go for it i yeah absolutely okay so um yeah foraging is becoming popular i've just seen it to take off in the past five years um so a lot of things I, or a few things i want to note on, on foraging is mushrooms are bioaccumulators um meaning they they're really good at uptaking like taking all the different things from their surrounding environment. Urban area or anywhere the real activity um, or anything that may be questionable, anything that's toxic or questionable in the ground, don't eat that mushroom. Uh, I have a friend who lives in a major city uh, who sends me a picture of a chicken of the woods. It's beautiful, man. Like, I mean, it'd be great eating, but it's, you know, sitting there collecting, you know, all sorts of road gunk. And it's you know right there you know in a suburban area and it's just there's it's untelling what is in that mushroom that you might be eating um, so that and also when you're foraging um, you're not allowed to forage in a few places like uh, you know private property obviously but we have a lot of national forests around our area and um, if someone were to get caught foraging there even though I could provide a good argument for the feds on why it's there's no harm in foraging uh, mushrooms uh, at all, really. Um, you will get, you know, a federal offense uh, if they catch you. So it's like, it's pretty ridiculous, but something that uh, is not a possibility. Um, let's see. And uh, just, I mean, turkey, they rise yourself with, uh, medicinal mushrooms. Turkey tail is an incredible mushroom that is full of polysaccharide K, which is being studied for all different types of cancer. And it, uh, they're finding that it allows uh, chemotherapy to do its job more effectively. So it's kind of this complement to chemo in a lot of ways. Um, and it grows everywhere year round. And it's one of the more easily identifiable mushrooms. Um, and it's abundant. Uh, you know, go out and collect it for my extracts and things like that. Uh, for my bone broth, I just walk to the tree and pop some off and throw it in my broth. Um, reishi grows abundantly on hemlocks, at least in the, well, I mean, the southeast, the Pacific Northwest, really everywhere. Um, chicken of the woods is super protein dense, uh, great to eat. So all these things, you know, seasonally, you can um, really feed yourself very well with these mushrooms uh, and your family um, or your friends uh, if you know what you're looking for um, but definitely uh, be aware of where you're foraging for if you want to get shot either and if you're foraging bright red or bright colors you know stay with a group it's easy to get lost in an unfamiliar place when you're foraging um, just some general you know your hunting pointers. seasons uh, <laughs> exactly exactly yes uh, I live, like, the hippie looking for mushrooms. <laughs> but, yeah, so yeah. Uh, that, um, that's super helpful. Um, I, I'm under the un impression that most foraging books on mushrooms are pretty like good. There's there's not like any that are uh, particularly like stay away from that one. At least that not that I'm aware of. If it's from a reputable company, right, right, um, yeah. It's, I can, I would say um, the companies I've had experience with field and forest products is a great company to work with. They've got passion. 
um, quality products. Um, North Spore, I've heard they're decent, um, but definitely look locally and kind of expand that circle out from there because um, I've just found that I've met so many cool people in my community through this work. Um, but just like the, the mutualistic aspect and the proto-cooperative aspect of uh, the my mycological world is great. For instance, I take my spent subs. I met someone at the farmer's market who has a freeze dryer. That's a really good way to preserve fresh ones. Uh, if not, in my opinion, the way to preserve mushrooms or a lot of food, for example, but it's expensive equipment that I don't. And this lady has very poor soil quality at her home. Uh, they're trying to, you know, you know, build up their quality to do vermicompost, um, but they need mushroom substrate block to build up their compost pile. So I take them a little substrate and then I'll take them uh, some pre-frozen mushrooms that I had over. I'll get them freeze dried. Um, I've developed a relationship and a friendship with these people. Um, it's wonderful. And that's just, uh, just a really good way to get involved with kind of like local food sovereignty. Um, I'm working with my local hospitality house. We're gonna plant a mushroom garden for them. So people can just come by and pick mushrooms and take them right to the kitchen and feed people who don't have access to healthy food. Um, and mushrooms are super good for you. They're full of vitamin D. I recommend if you find wild harvested stuff, flip it over, let the gills, the underside go to the sun and let it sit in the sun for 30 minutes and it uptakes uh, like crazy. I think it's like somewhere like 30% more vitamin D that way. Um, but they're, you know, by weight, they're one of the more protein rich sources, uh, more protein than any plant um, and full of just things that help regulate your gut. Um, Oh, something else I wanted to note real quick. Penn State is like, they're kind of like the gurus of mushroom research and they have done a big study that spans from the 70s to now. And they find that if you eat 20 grams of mushrooms a day, uh, it reduces your overall cancer risk by up to 50%. I think it's like 49%, um, which is incredible. Like that's groundbreaking. And it's, uh, I wrote it down. Um, Ergothionin is the compound that is present that ha uh, is responsible for those effects. And um, your bellas, your uh, portabellas, your creminis, and things like that that you see in the grocery store, those are very like subpar quality mushrooms as far as uh, the health aspects go. They contain a, a very minute amount of ergothionin, whereas your shiitakes, your maitakes, your oyster mushrooms, a lot of your wild forage stuff um, is higher in that compound. Um, so it's just they're it's, it's just a great um, kind of niche food source to incorporate um, that will just, I've, I've noticed my personal health and wellness has just increased quite a bit just from incorporating mushrooms, especially as far as my digestion goes, mental clarity and things like that. So. Um, awesome. I do want to recommend one book, uh, Radical Mycology, and it's by Peter McCoy. And for uh, he's def it's definitely uh, like a decentralized leftist approach um, to mushrooms. It's full of just wisdom. It's a little expensive, but it's money's worth. And Peter McCoy's done some great work. Um, so yeah, and I learned, I want to shout out real quick to my friend uh, out in Oregon who I learned all of this or a, a good bit of this from. Uh, it's Fungi for the People. Um, the logo is a spore print and a fist. So uh, that tells you all you need to know, but his name's Jay Schindler. He's doing a lot of great work out there um, out in Oregon. I think he's South East Oregon, but uh, Awesome. Jay, if you ever see it. Cool. This, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Radical Mycology is a great book. Uh, I did grab my uh, foraging book that I use. It's obviously yeah. for my area. It's great. It's a little, it's literally like this. It's very simple. Sorry, it's backwards for me. So I keep screwing it up. Um, oh, yeah. That's great. Like, it, it gives you like a very clear 
explanation of everything, uh, any comparable mushrooms if you're worried about lookalikes. Uh, it's it's a good little book. I think it was like seven bucks. So they're definitely out there. Yeah, um, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I had a book right here. If you guys are like the Bible, essentially, is uh, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms by Paul Stamets. Uh, it's the third edition. It's thick. It's got every kind of cult. I mean, not every kind. There's like over 500 cultivatable kinds of mushrooms, but all the main ones, how to grow them, all the different methodologies, the straw method, um, the, from the lowest tech to the most complicated. Um, it's been basically the industry standard um, for quite a while. So, um, you know, anyone with mushrooms knows Paul Stanley. Yep. Uh, so, uh, I, th I think that's probably it. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, uh, any takers or do you have anything else you wanted to add or, uh, no, just thank y'all for tuning into my ramblings, uh, on mushrooms. <laughs> Not often. That yeah, I it was great. <laughs> um, so Avery, this has been fantastic. Um, the, uh, go throw him a couple bucks on Venmo for taking his time to chat with us. Uh, his Venmo handles right there. Um, so I think it was really cool, really interesting. We do one of these a month, or we're going to do at least one of these a month moving forward. Um, also, you can find High Country Fungi on Instagram at High, Fung High Country Fungi. Uh, for folks that don't follow us on um, Instagram or listen to our podcast, go check out the Poor Pearls Almanac. That's where we're most active is Instagram. Uh, I posted the Discord link for folks that are interested. Uh, I do want to do a quick shout out to some of our patrons. Um, so I owe a few folks. So Evan, N-O-V-C, E-Y, Evan Geiger, Jared Gordon, James Gilmore, uh, William Clemens, Bryce Nelson, Devin Viola, Max Thompson, Amelia Bergen, Lionel Hunjet, Natalie, Edward C., Nick, C.W., Becerra, Becerra C, uh, Naki Tiki, um, Laura L, Jordan, Jackson H, Max L, The Night Library, Austin S, Elizabeth B, Caleb D, Daniel B, Sally P, Maddie R, Turtle Bug, uh, Paige B, Nate R, Nate C, Michael B, Sarah Beth, and Micah. So that's that's a chunk of the list that I owe. Um, so yeah, next uh, up for us is going to be the Solar Punk Farmer uh, next month. I believe it's January 10th. Uh, we're going to be talking about doing um, DIY um, aquaponics and uh, all that good stuff, which again, it's not really my forte. So I'm going to be learning along with you guys. So hopefully you guys found this interesting and insightful. Go support our, our buddy Avery on uh, Venmo if you can. And until next time, my name is Andy, and this is the Poor Pearls Almanac. Thanks, guys. <laughs>